Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lily Adams. I'll be leading the workshop. Um, I want to kick us off by thanking Sean Tenney for taking notes today, um, Madison Arnold, Arnold Skirbo for facilitating, and CB Events for doing all the amazing tech. Um, Madison and our tech folks are going to be monitoring the chat throughout this workshop. Um, so if you have questions, tech issues, things to share, anything like that, please do use the chat. Um, I also want to let everyone know that this is being recorded and we will save the chat afterwards. If you have any issues with that, um, I would recommend turning off your camera. Um, and then, of course, thank you to Back from the Brink and ICANN for putting on this wonderful event and having this workshop. Um, so like I said, my name is Lily Adams. I'm an outreach consultant at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, and I'm also the founder of the Nuclear Voices Project, which aims to build connections between frontline nuclear frontline communities and the nuclear policy community in the US. And I'd like to start today by recognizing that I am living and working on stolen indigenous land. I know everyone here is joining from across the country, perhaps outside of the United States. Uh, but for me personally, I live in New York City in Manhattan. So um, I'm living on Muncie Lenape land from which the Lenape people were forcibly removed. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that indigenous people are disproportionately harmed by nuclear weapons through their testing, production, uranium mining. Um, and that's an ongoing form of colonialism and violence against indigenous communities. So uh, today, this workshop is called Building a Diverse and Inclusive Movement. Um, we're going to, I'll, I'll start by sharing a little of my background um, and the frame that I'm going to use to talk about this topic. Um, we'll take a look at a resource. Uh, oh, um, I'm hearing someone say they can't hear me. Can others hear me? Are you able? Okay, great. Just want to make sure that's not a universal issue. Um, great. So we'll, we're going to take a look at a resource from the Nuclear Voices Project around how to work equitably with frontline communities. Um, we'll go into some breakout rooms for a few minutes to discuss um, in smaller groups, and then we'll come back together and have some time to share and have a question and answer session. Um, so my background is in environmental community organizing, and then I worked at Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility um, for a few years in Washington State running their anti-nuclear weapons program, and I'm now a consultant at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, while I was in Washington, uh, it's when I began focusing on the ways that the nuclear system harms the health, environment, and culture of communities. Um, and my entry into this was by meeting people in the Marshallese community. Um, there's a large population of people in Washington state who moved from the Marshall Islands, um, in part because of their health needs resulting from nuclear testing. So this really opened my eyes to thinking about nuclear weapons from the perspective of what they mean to nuclear frontline communities. And I'm going to actually just share something in the chat here, a definition of when I say nuclear frontline communities, what I mean by that. Um, so, so when I say this, I mean those who are most directly um, impacted and harmed by nuclear weapons, especially through weapons production, testing, um, and waste cleanup and storage. They generally have faced and often continue to face the highest levels of exposure to radiation and other toxins um, and will suffer disproportionate health, environmental, and cultural harms. Um, frontline communities are also very often from communities of color, indigenous communities, and poor and rural communities. So these are issues that are harming people to this day. Um, it's not just an issue of the past. Um, and I think when you look at nuclear weapons in this way and consider these issues, um, nuclear weapons are as much an environmental, social, and racial justice issue as they are a national security issue. Uh, and I think it's very important to be um, talking about this at an event celebrating the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, since the TPNW also highlights this aspect of nuclear weapons, um, understanding that the disproportionate harms of um, nuclear weapons are a big part of the basis of looking at um, uh, this issue from a humanitarian perspective. And these are issues are explicitly acknowledged in the preamble to the treaty as well. So when we talk about um, diversifying the movement, I think this is important an important way that we can both broaden what we often mean by the peace and nuclear movement and work more meaningfully with groups outside of the nuclear space. Uh, for example, with environmental groups, social justice groups, health groups. 
Um, but unfortunately, I find that often in the United States, our work on nuclear weapons policy generally doesn't involve communities that have been directly harmed. Um, not always, but generally. Uh, nuclear policy work is often seen as separate from work with frontline communities. And in my mind, an effective nuclear weapons community and effective strategy puts these communities that have been most harmed at the center of our work uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons and really recognizes the personal perspectives and expertise that they bring to this issue um, that often the nuclear policy world lacks. So if we buy into that frame, then there's work to do to build those relationships um, and to build a powerful movement that's really rooted in justice. Um, but we also want to ensure that as we're doing that outreach and seeking that collaboration, that it's done equitably and in a way that's mutually beneficial. When we're not careful, um, this can be exploitative or extractive or tokenizing. Essentially, that outreach can cause harm, um, even when our intentions are good. And I think an important piece of this when we're talking about building a diverse and inclusive movement is that our goal shouldn't be just to get other people to care about nuclear weapons or to convince them to work on this issue. Um, that's a, a pretty exploitative way to view this when we only think about it one direction, you coming to me. Um, instead, our point should be to think about building a diverse and inclusive movement by building mutually beneficial and respectful relationships. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. And um, uh, the resource that I'm about to share has some specific suggestions and guidance for how to work equitably with frontline communities and incorporate this perspective. Um, so this resource was created in collaboration with a number of nuclear frontline community advocates um, as part of the Nuclear Voices Project that I mentioned before. Um, so I wanna take a moment to thank the individuals that specifically helped create it and inform it, and in some cases inspire it. So, um, Trisha Pritikin is a Hanford Downwinder and longtime advocate. Um, Beata Sosi Pena from um, Tewa Women United. She's their Environmental Health and Justice Program Coordinator. Uh, Jennifer Selig, a former Utah State Senator. And Kelly Campbell, the Executive Director of Oregon PSR. These were all folks that had a lot of input and spent time with me creating this resource. Um, and then before we dive in, I want to acknowledge a few things here. Um, I'm learning and growing in this area. I don't claim to be an expert. I wanna recognize that there are a lot of people in this room um, that have expertise and I hope I can learn from you today as well and have this be as much of a discussion as we can in a virtual setting with many people. Um, I also recognize that we're all coming from a variety of different backgrounds here. Um, you might see yourself in the peace and nuclear weapons world or outside of it. Um, you might identify as someone from a nuclear frontline community or not. Um, in general, this resource was written for people in the nuclear policy world, especially white people like myself or people who identify as white, um, but I don't want to assume that everyone is coming from that perspective. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge the fact that um, there's some irony to me being a white woman with a lot of privilege talking about diversifying the movement. Um, and I had hoped originally to do this with a frontline community member and ran into some snags. And I want to acknowledge those here too, that in part, I ran out of time recruiting someone in a way that felt equitable to me. And I think that's a sign that this work takes time. It's easy to deprioritize it. And um, that, you know, continually comes up in our work. And I'm sorry for that. Um, I also had been thinking of a number of colleagues that lately I've been asking to do a lot of events. Um, and this happens a lot too, where we make these connections and then overburden people or ask too much of them. And so I was hesitant to do that. And it's a sign for me to keep diversifying my networks more, keep building connections. Um, so just some indicators that, you know, this is an ongoing process that I'm working on too. And I wanna recognize that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and put this resource in the chat. So this is a link to the Nuclear Voices website and the specific resource. So um, I hope folks are able to see that if you are not able to follow it or having any issues with that link, um, please let us know in the chat. And then um, we're gonna take five minutes here just for everyone to take a little time and read through this. Um, so it'll be some solo reading time and then we'll all come back together right around um, 
one o'clock or a minute before. Um, so we're going to get started with the discussion. I wanted to start by sharing some kind of more concrete examples of how these can play out. Um, so I'm going to give an example with one of these suggestions of a time that things didn't go well. I think it's just as important to recognize um, when things go well as when things don't so we can learn from them. Um, so the um, tip that I'm going to go through is in the last section, which is the um, specific tips and best practices. And it's the second one there. So if you're planning an event or project, be sure to include frontline community members from the beginning, not as an afterthought. Um, they should have an equal say in decision making and establishing the scope and logistics of the project. Um, they should not be approached once all the major decisions about the project have been decided. Um, so there was an event I worked on a couple years ago in Washington State, and we worked with the Marshallese community there. Um, and it was uh, with a, a major partner in the nuclear weapons space. And we did ask someone from the Marshallese community to join the event, but we did the opposite of what was explained here. We kind of asked them once we'd already dec decided on the agenda, once we decided on the structure of the event, basically all the major decisions had been made. We were asking them to just slot into a very specific um, piece of the event. Um, and so when we asked them, they had all these wonderful ideas about how they could um, join the event and share their work in a different way, share their culture. Um, and it just didn't fit into what we had already decided for the event. And from my mind, it was a huge disservice, um, both to the event itself, which would have really benefited from these uh, ways that they wanted to join. Um, and it was a disservice to the community. Uh, so when we reflected back on this event, you know, after with the Marshallese community and other folks who'd organized it, we really realized, you know, what we should have done was approach the, you know, Marshallese advocate we were working with from the very beginning, um, design the agenda and the structure of the event, um, including their perspectives and their suggestions. And that probably would have been a much better event. Um, luckily, the uh, Marshallese advocate I worked with was uh, a strong advocate for himself as well. And we did end up bringing in some really wonderful aspects into the event still. So there was a, a mixed bag, a positive outcome as well, um, but that won't always happen. And so, you know, we were lucky that we still had, you know, a positive outcome there, but definitely a big lesson learned. Um, I am gonna pass it over to our facilitator, Madison Arnold Scrobo as well, to share one more example um, from a time that things went very well. Thanks, Lily. My name is Madison Arnold Scribbo, she, her, hers, and I am an outreach and communication specialist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And I'm also a member of the facilitating group of the Back from the Brink campaign. And so I'm here helping Lily um, with this workshop because I think this is an incredibly important topic. I think we all need to be involved in building a diverse and inclusive movement for nuclear weapons abolition. Um, and as you hopefully were able to read in the amazing resource Lily shared, uh, one of the most important elements of that is building relationships. So I have a really quick story um, about an experience I was involved with that exemplifies that. So a few years ago, I was with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, and we organized an event we called the Portland No Nukes Forum. It was a set of interactive workshops that was on the health threats and the social justice concerns of nuclear weapons and nuclear power. And there's a few reasons I'd like to share about why this event really exemplifies these themes of authentic relationship building, including diverse perspectives and inclusivity. So it was an in-person event before COVID. Um, it was set up in learning stations, which was really cool. So participants traveled around the room in small groups and heard really short presentations on a variety of ways that nuclear weapons intersect with things like gender, nuclear sacrifice zones, the moral implications of our federal budget, um, and some other justice issues. And what I think is most important is that this event was a product of years of intentional partnership and relationship building in the community. And so it was co-hosted by groups who usually focus on the just transition away from fossil fuels and environmental justice, um, who had a history of working with us um, when I was with Oregon PSR. And so because of that, the event brought in a lot of new voices um, and new experiences um, of people who were interested in climate justice and were able to learn a lot more about nuclear weapons. A few other details, there was Spanish translation in both the promotion and the event itself. 
And my personal favorite fact about this event is that we serve dinner. Uh, this event was two years ago, but I still remember the really delicious tamales that we ordered from a local restaurant. So again, I just wanted to share that as an example of an event that I think did a really great job of modeling relationship building and inclusivity. Um, and if you have questions, Lily and I were both there, including Sean, um, who's our note taker, and maybe other folks on this call. Thanks. Thanks so much, Madison. Um, okay, so we're going to go into breakout rooms now. And my hope, um, we will see how this goes, is that folks can discuss the resource in smaller groups. And then we'll come back together after a few minutes. And we'll have time to share some things that you discussed uh, via the chat. Um, and then uh, we'll also um, have uh, time for a question and answer. So if we can do um, around 13 breakout rooms, I think that would be good for the tech folks. And then I'm going to post um, what you can add some ideas for what to discuss uh, in the chat here to everyone. And I do want to mention again. Um, so I get oh, before I do, you know, introduce yourselves to each other. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking at this resource, think about how it relates to your work and your experiences. Um, for any of these guidelines or tips, um, are there times you've done these things well, or times it didn't go so well, and there were lessons learned, or are there, you know, groups that you can apply these to, um, and think about something you might be able to share back. And as I mentioned before, this resource was written mostly for people in the nuclear weapons policy space, which is predominantly white, um, to help people reach out to frontline communities. But I don't want to assume that everyone is coming from that place. So if you identify as part of a nuclear frontline community um, or an indigenous community or from a community of color, I'd love to also hear your feedback on this resource. If you agree with the things here, if you disagree, if you have things to add or change, that sort of thing. Again, I'm always looking for suggestions and feedback. Um, Okay, so I think folks can head into their breakout rooms now. You should be getting a little pop-up on your screen that has a button to join a breakout room. Follow that link and then um, at the end of the breakout room session, uh, you will be prompted to join back in to the main room. If you would like to um, make a comment, just to put that into the chat to Madison. Um, and then she can just call on people and we can just start start a discussion. How does that sound to people? <laughs> yeah, I can All right. start sharing, Lily, because there's some folks that have put some stuff in the chat. Go um, for it, yeah. So I can read out aloud what people said and then a few people I can call on. So um, Mark says the nuclear weapons free movement needs to recognize the mistakes it has made in the past and the resource doesn't address that. Great point. Um, and then, um, a person named Frank Breens can share something. Frank, do you want to unmute yourself and share? Yeah, very quickly. Um, I'm a member of Pax Christi Metro New York. We've been trying very hard to include people of color and uh, young people in our group, but it's very difficult. Uh, when we have the assembly, we have uh, uh, students from uh, Manhattan College and Fordham uh, University but whether they continue with the group is questionable. So, uh, but I found uh, those uh, uh, pointers very helpful though. And it's something that we can reflect on. And somebody else in our group said the same thing. Uh, they have a lot of medical students and they're young and they're trying very hard to get them involved in their group as well. Yeah, this is Mark, can I share something with what I said, why I said that? Sure, go ahead, Mark. Okay, I, I, I just, just very quickly, I think a movement needs to understand the mistakes that it's made in the past, particularly when it goes back to the nuclear weapons freeze days. Uh, the rejection in the preamble of the nuclear freeze was it did not want to mention human needs. And that was based upon how white people felt about it. All right, so that had a detrimental effect. Then, um, we, we need to recognize the leadership that does exist in, in Black communities. Like, for instance, uh, Ron Dellums was a major leader. The Congressional Black Caucus in legislative was, was in leadership. And one thing that I noticed about uh, in the nuclear Whip weapons freeze movement, the California movement did not want to put resources into the Black community to advocate when the referendum came up. But when the referendum came up, the black community voted for the nuclear weapons freeze. So I think there's some damaging things about how you how we relate to quote 
the white priest movement and uh, the, 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 the nuclear issue weapons, uh, uh, our past needs to be reckoned with. And I think the resource is a good resource to start with, I'll, I'll say that. Thanks so much, Mark, for sharing those thoughts. Um, Frank, I wanted to uh, really quickly address something you'd said of, you know, um, how to, you know, working to try to involve more young people, more people of color in your meetings, um, but, you know, struggling to do that. And I think it's important to note that we can't just hope that people will show up and want to work on these issues. And um, part of, uh, you know, engaging more people is taking the time to build relationships and to say, you know, if you're, you know, hoping to work with more communities of color, what are the you know, issues that they are working on too? And how can your group also support that, address those issues so that it is reciprocal? I think that's an important piece of um, ensuring that you're you know, actually building a relationship and not just asking people to work on um, what you were doing. But also I'd love to hear if anyone else has thoughts on that um, from, what, from what Frank said. I'd like to say just a couple of things real quickly. Um, I'm a president of the International Network of Educators, and we've had priority of education in the area of nuclear weapons for since 2005. And um, you know, we're we have a broad approach, including human rights. And one of the things that that we did last year is when the Universal Periodic Review was coming up, and the Black Lives Matter issue was front and center on that. We signed on to the letters that went to the UPR because the U.S. had withdrawn from the UPR process universal periodic review. So we, civil society, can actually make those kinds of reports. So we, we joined in on the letters that had to do with the Black Lives Matter, but also we filed our own report, which linked the, the, the um, but U.S. budget for nuclear weapons as being something that draws resources away from communities that we need. So, and it was actually accepted as a as one of the you know points to be made. So, and the reason I'm bringing this up is that you know I agree that I've been involved in a very long time with trying to focus on <laughs> nuclear weapons, but I I came to the conclusion about how important with young people it is to do education, and a lot of people are really reluctant about that, but it's possible. For instance, in Florida, if you go to look at high school education about uh, fit in physics, they'll start, they give an example of a nuclear power plant and that's what the kids learn. So just in the same way that the, you know, the Jewish community has been able to make Holocaust um, learning a part of education, I think that we need that sort of thing to happen for nuclear weapons. And just one last thing, I, one of the things that really pointed me in this direction also about seven years ago as I was at a, um, I'm in Florida, I was at a Catholic University's International Peace me uh, Meeting. And there was a young woman there originally from India who had studied in, in England and then she came to Columbia to do a, a master's in, in um, genocide and human rights. And she was required to take an, a course on nuclear weapons. And she did not want to take it. She was bored by it. She didn't, you know, but after she, when she got into it, she realized how important it was. And she said it changed her life because as a Sikh in India, she realized how the weapons of that sort could be, could be definitely related to genocide and human rights. So that totally blew me away that a person like that could go, go through so much education, so much focus and be totally <laughs> unaware, <laughs> just, amazing to me because I had made a little you know kind of we had each if you wanted to set up some kind of workshop you could and I put that and she showed up so inviting you so trying to get young people trying to get education to happen is really important I think especially in the U.S. Great thanks so much Terry um I want to make sure we get to some of these other folks that are in the queue so wow, I see thank you David. yeah Sorry. thanks um I have we have David Newman Daryl Kimball and then Andre are in Andre Sheldon are in the queue to speak so David um I put my comments in the chat I won't take much time I'm from Winnipeg Canada uh I've got 25 years of immersive humbling uh unlearning and learning from indigenous peoples um in my chat, I put diversity as a fact, inclusion is a choice, equity is never ending hard work, 
uh, but humility for us who are white privileged uh, is absolutely critical. And that requires a lot of uh, repeated humbling as we bumble along trying to build relationships with uh, people that have vastly different life experiences uh, and, uh, and uh, often traumatized backgrounds. So learning from them uh, and, and humbling yourself is the way to build uh, relationships. I found the materials you provided at the outset were very, uh, very well done and fit uh, the kind of work we do uh, in Canada with Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nye, is Daryl Kimball next? Is that right? Hi, everybody. I'm Daryl Kimball. I'm with the Arms Control Association, and I've been working in the, the peace and disarmament movement for about 30 years um, and come from a community that was affected by nuclear weapons production. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Lily for the, the, uh, the resource and uh, David's remarks just a second ago, I think I agree with. I would just note that um, one of the opportunities that those of us who work on nuclear disarmament issues and who want to redirect federal spending priorities in better ways uh, is to reach out to uh, the national and the local poor people's campaign um, uh, leaders at the, the national and the grassroots level. Um, this is a very um, dynamic um, uh, intersectional effort uh, to address racial justice issues, economic uh, inequality problems and also to uh, radically cut the defense budget and, and specifically nuclear weapons. And um, so I would just point out that they are a, a key ally. Um, we have a natural uh, common interest uh, with a lot of their, uh, a lot of their work. And, and I, would just, I would just point to them uh, as, as, a, as a, uh, an organization that, that might be worth reaching out to. Thank you. Um, I think we have Andre Sheldon next in the queue and also just highlighting Madison's um, post here. If there are others who would like to speak or offer, um, you know, remarks, reactions on the resource, please uh, message Madison to get in the queue. All right, Andre. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Hello, Lily. Uh, I think we have an amazing opportunity at our fingertips, and that's to unite the world. Uh, because Secretary General Guterres issued a call for a global ceasefire. This was profound because stopping war affects all issues. And that's what we're trying to do is to disarm and stop war. So now it's time for a global peace movement. And because it can unite all the movements, all the religions, all the organizations, all the mayors and community leaders in every city because they want to stop violence. And so we have an opportunity. Uh, I've been very fortunate to connect with people in the UN at the Secretary General's office. And we, I've been proposing that we start in September of this year. So the, all the mechanisms are in place. I'd like to ask you all to in, in, invite you to please check a global strategy of nonviolence.org. Uh, contact me. This is the time for all the organizations. So to build an inclusive, diverse movement. So please consider it. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see we have Masako Toki in the queue. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, this is amazing uh, uh, workshop. I really, really learning a lot. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm very, very passionate about youth education. I work at the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies in Monterey, California. So it's uh, more academic, but uh, I really value the youth education. And uh, one of my main project is uh, promoting disarmament and non-proliferation education for high school students. And mm -hmm. this program has been going almost 20 years. And I'm really trying to diversify and really trying to reach out to schools in more underserved communities. But it's a bit difficult, you know, I'm really trying to engage more public high schools. But the truth is that there are many <clears throat> private high schools, which is also great, but I just really wanted to reach out to more public high schools, especially students who 
don't have opportunity to study this issue if you don't join this kind of a program. So if you have any like, uh, you know, uh, advice or, uh, or anything, uh, I would really like to hear. And uh, I'm also coordinating, especially during the quarantine, I'm coordinating um, speakers series inviting atomic bombing survivors or any experts. And uh, if you are interested in it, I'm posting a lot of information on my uh, Twitter or Facebook. So just uh, reach out to me. I think this is also going to be a very uh, good opportunity for students to, to start learning the nuclear issues. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry we don't have more time to respond, but I think we have Mary Olson and then Nimao Mataria also in the queue. So I think if we can try to fit both folks in, that would be great. So Mary, if you go next. Hi. Um, keeping it short, as a white person, I learned that I need to join rather than expecting everyone to join me. And this began with younger people and the climate movement to great success about 10, 15 years ago. Um, at the moment, I see the Poor People's Campaign and Black Lives Matter as an unparalleled opportunity for us as white people predominantly on this meeting and in our movement to join. And in whatever way that makes sense, it doesn't have to have one picture, but join rather than expecting people to come join us. And the last thing I wanna offer is that during that height of the big movement, people in our community were reaching out to each other to try and figure out messaging and, and common, making common cause. And for me, it was so obvious. We've all lost our self-determination when someone gave a button to a national leader and could destroy the world. We all lost our self-determination. And the civil rights movement and people of color movement in this nation is all about self-determination. So join, join knowing there is common ground and then build that out. And that's, I think, an enormous opportunity that didn't exist five years ago. There wasn't this level of organization or opportunity for someone like me or for you to show up in some way and support. And that's where we build the common ground. Thanks. And then we'll end with Nemo. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm actually in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, so I think what I'd like to uh, share is more of um, when we talk of inclusivity, there's definitely never a level ground. And that's basically, that is life, right? So I think um, I've, I've listened to people talking about um, how we can get people to get involved. But the truth of the matter is we have to be sober about primary and going into secondary. What's primary for me is not going to be primary for someone else, depending on where we are at, um, in our, you know, our experiences, our exposure, our trauma. So I think when we speak grassroots, it's always a challenge to realistically think of are we trying to cause awareness and sensitivity to issues that are extremely secondary to a certain population because what's primary for them is not hearing a gunshot for one night. And what's primary for someone else is being able to eat or get off um, food stamps for the next few months. So um, I know I've basically done a lot of grassroots level work, but from where I'm from, I'm from Kenya. So I recently came here. My background is in peace and conflict resolution. So I think it's a challenge to each one of us to always have that at the back of our mind so that we can know what partnerships we are able to bring on board so that it's a smooth, almost like a ripple effect. If we deal with this first, then everything else can actually fall into place. And I think there's a huge disconnect as far as that is concerned, um, especially in just being sober and realistic about those issues. So how do we foster partnerships that can actually facilitate and accommodate smooth transitions, even as we try to create awareness around nuclear weapons? So I think that's just a challenge to all of us in whatever field we are in. Um, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Those are, I think, excellent thoughts to end on. Um, really important to share. And I'm also writing down notes to include more specific things about that in the resource. So thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you, everyone. I think we are at time, actually two minutes over time, so I apologize. But thank you for bearing with all of the Zoom tech and the breakout rooms. I appreciate it. It was wonderful to have this discussion at the end. And I really appreciate hearing everyone's thoughts. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, to Madison again and to Sean for taking notes and to our tech folks. Um, I think with that, I will let you all go off to the next breakout room.